So I'm going to just start with a, just a couple minute brief introduction, a little bit more about um, what the Trauma and Learning Policy Initiative is and how we structure our work. And then Joe is going to take it away and really talk about what trauma sensitive schools looks like at the school level, how schools go about creating trauma sensitive schools. And then he's going to kick it back to me for more of the policy piece. And I'll share with you some of the advocacy that we've done around education policy in Massachusetts and, and also you know, where we still have yet to go. So our project, the Trauma and Learning Policy Initiative, is a collaboration between two organizations. Harvard Law School is one of them, as Katie mentioned. The other one is Massachusetts Advocates for Children which is a nonprofit children's rights organization in Boston um, that has a 45-year history of doing some of the most innovative advocacy on behalf of vulnerable kids. MAC advocated for the first state special education laws in the country, which then became the model for the federal IDEA. Um, also some of the, I think the first school breakfast laws in the country, the first lead paint laws in the country. So really on the cutting edge of children's issues. Um, and we're you know, proud to think that uh, we've had some role to play in, in starting the trauma-sensitive schools movement as well, as, as Katie said. Our mission is to ensure that children traumatized by exposure to violence and other adverse childhood experiences succeed in school. So it's a really big mission. Um, we'll be working on it for years to come, but we think it's a really important mission. And this is how we go about doing that. The first thing that we do, and actually this is where the work started, is that, as Katie mentioned, we represent individual families in the special education system. And it was through representing families of kids with disabilities that we first started to see the role that trauma can play in learning and behavior and relationships at school. And so this is what we do um, in the Harvard Education Law Clinic. We're teaching law students how to represent these families. And all of the families that we accept for representation in our clinic have children who not only have the disabilities that qualify them for special education under state and federal law, but they've had some form of traumatic experience. And what we're really trying to do in these cases is see what that interface is between the experiences that kids have had and then the disabilities and the challenges that they're presenting with at school. And our idea is that if we really want to change the system to be responsive to the needs of some of our most vulnerable kids and families we need to understand in a really up close and personal way what the experience of those families are. And that's the role that our cases play. We know we're not gonna change the system by representing individual kids because there's way too many that need help and we'll, we're never gonna get to all of them. But we can use that representation as a window into the system. The second thing that we do, and this is what Joe and um, our colleague Ann Eisner um, spend lots and lots of time doing is working directly in schools, trying to help educators create trauma-sensitive learning environments. And Joe's going to share with you a lot more about that work. Then what we try to do is take the voices of the families that we represent and the voices of the educators that we're working with and bring both of those voices up to the policy level and try to help policymakers understand not just what kid, kids need and not just what educators need to meet kids' needs, but really how when you stop and listen, what families need and what educators want are most often the same thing. And yet often um, you don't see organizations or advocacy efforts trying to bring both voices together. But we really make an effort to do that. And so these are the three prongs of our process and the way that we go about doing our work. Um, Katie mentioned our two publications, Helping Traumatized Children Learn, Volumes 1 and 2. What we're going to share with you over the rest of our presentation, and then really happy to take all your questions afterwards, is what the core ideas are that are in these two books. So if you haven't had a chance to read them yet, um, or if you don't get the chance to, you'll at least get the um, sort of the elevator pitch, what the, the five core ideas are. Um, and we're gonna hand it over to Joe at this point, and he'll start walking you through these five core ideas. Yeah, hi, I'm Joe. <laughs> It's, it's really good to be here. You know, I've known Katie for many years through the work we do over at, at, at Oak, and certainly a lot of the funding that's kept us going has come from the Oak Foundation, which is based here in the, the Durham Chapel Hill Oak area. So uh, delighted to be here and, and very excited to see a lot of teachers and educators in the room. It's a small group, so as I'm going through, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to cover a lot of information very quickly because I want to get to how one creates. Um, what are the underlying uh, components of trauma-sensitive school? Um, so if 
there's a question you have as I'm moving through about an information or detail, please feel free to ask. I can expand on something, but like I said, I'm going to make some assumptions about information base as I move through, and if you have a question, let me know. So there are five core ideas. This, this if you will, is sort of um, the cornerstones of the work that we do and why we do it. And I think the first piece of that is that many students have had traumatic experiences. It became very clear to us early on that we needed to move trauma from being considered a niche of special education to the mainstream that it really deserves, given uh, you know, a lot of the research that's been done. And one of the, the key elements of that research uh, is the A study. And I'm assuming you all are probably pretty familiar with the A study. This is a summary of some of the um, frequencies of adverse childhood experience from that first study that, pu that was published in 1998. Again, without spending a lot of time going through it, the point is these experiences are here. And of the individuals in this initial A study, if you incorporate neglect into the uh, elements in addition to the abuse we have here, the abuse categories and, and the dysfunction categories, you have adverse childhood experiences in about 64% of the individuals in the study, close to two thirds. That's amazing. You know, I was talking to teachers, one of the group of teachers, I said, you know, if, if epidemic is 10, 12%, pandemic is like 18, 20%, what do you call 64%? And the teacher raised her hand and said, um, that's mainstream. That's, that's the way it is. That's just part of it. And I think she encapsulated in that comment exactly the point that, you know, we certainly try to make with the study, which is that the, the prevalence is there. These experiences are here in our children. They're here in us. And the second core idea, uh, after we establish that, is that trauma can impact learning in a very significant way. You know, the impact of trauma on learning. Um, when you mention it to a lot of people, um, and they, they think about kids impacted by trauma, in many cases the, the response is, it shows itself as behavioral dysregulation. And that's certainly a place where it can show up. But it can show up in a very broad range of learning impacts in addition to self-regulatory problems. It can show up and look like a learning disability. It can look like language issues. It can look like an individual who struggles with relationships. And so as um, we kind of work at helping people understand what that piece is, we always begin with, so what, what is trauma? And to understand that trauma is less about the event and more about the response. And it's a response in an individual that can be mitigated by things like individual characteristics, the individual's experience, the individual's cognitive abilities, uh, the individual's connection to community. It can be mediated by those community connections and who is in that individual's life to help explain, understand, to help soften what some of that traumatic experience might have for them, to, to help with that response. Um, and so we we begin to look at that as trauma, again, to begin to separate it from, or if you will, extend it from the A study. Um, and then we look at the impacts it can have. And if you look at the impact on learning, it can have skill impacts in learning. Language, memory, sequential memory, cause effect. You know, think about teaching in a classroom, critical thinking. Oftentimes we'll present material, like an ELA class. Reading a book, stop before the end of the book, what do you think is going to happen next? We're asking students to understand and develop with the pertinent details, a chronology of that story, understand how those elements interact and interrelate, and make a prediction about what might happen next. And use that as an opportunity for critical thinking. If I'm struggling with memory, I'm struggling with sequential memory cause effect, that's going to be something outside of my not only skill set, but in many cases my abilities, if I'm struggling with memory. Learning process, executive function, goal, plan, do, review, goal-directed behavior. It's very organized and structured, and remembering those processes. I do something successfully once, I take that plan, I store it away, I pull it out next time. Sequential, cause-effect, remembered retrieval. Again, if I'm struggling with memory, or if by bent of my... Um, uh, experience, I tend to be a student who presents as hypervigilant and I have trouble focusing. How do I remember those details? How do I bring that back in a meaningful way? Um, transitions can often be very difficult for students. 
Um, and transition is a time when if I'm feeling settled and safe, and then everything is sort of, it's up in the air. And now I'm in a position where I move to a new place, a classroom and a school, I need to settle that down. And if I'm hypervigilant, if I'm concerned for safety, if I'm not feeling settled, it can take me a while to settle in that classroom if in fact I settle at all. Behavior. And this is where a lot of folks think, this is what a lot of folks think of when they think of the impact of trauma. You know, um, there is that sort of impulsive, hyperactive, labile, rapid, unexpected emotional shifts. Some kids learn if they push back, they get a little aggressive, they can begin to exert some control. And control feels pretty good because I'm feeling safe now. I can exert some control here. Um, I don't oral read today. In fact, I never oral read. So please stop asking me to do that in class. Right? I'm pushing back. I'm trying to exert control in that situation. Um, but there's a third group of kids. You know, you've got these kids who are popping off. You've got these aggre aggressive, defiant kids. Um, the third group of those kids who just are under the radar. I stay safe by staying under the radar. And I know there's a student that particularly stands out in my mind that I worked with when I first started working in high schools. I didn't work with her. She just came to visit and we chatted. She was just a kid I knew in the high school. Twelve years after she graduates, I get a letter from her thanking me for being there for her. She was just a regular kid in the high school. No one knew anything that was going on and she thanked me because her dad was physically abusing her at home on a regular basis. School was her safe place to be and I was to transition in. Probably me because I was very young then. We got along really well. It was one of those sort of instant get along kind of situations. Easy to talk, it didn't take effort. But I was that transition in that, oh, I can exhale now, I'm in a safe place. Had no idea. So the kids are here and I think I, I spend a little time talking about that one because although we'd like to think we can recognize or maybe understand who these students are among us, we can't. We don't know who they are. Last piece is relationships. You know, all that executive function, those language skills, that organizing, all that um, behavior that I talked about, that doesn't just show up in class. It shows up in my relationships with peers and adults. So I've got someone in my peer group who is reactive, someone who, whose moods shift so rapidly, it's almost not frightening, but it's disconcerting. I, I really am uncomfortable being around this person. They try to tell you a story. Story is how we develop and build relationship. I try to tell a story, but I can't tell it. The stories are always convoluted. I don't get the point. I lose interest. Who wants to be that person's friend? How do those relationships get built? And so you have these multi-impact potential uh, effects or, uh, from this traumatic experience that can bring students to a place where they don't have the requisite skills we'd like them to have coming into school to be successful. They might have some learning issues that are getting in the way. They might have some behavioral issues that are getting in the way, either uh, external or internalizing. And they might have some difficulty relating and connecting to the community. If we're not aware of that, very oftentimes staff in school begin to see kids, these manifest students, and their manifestations of some of these traumatic impacts in ways that are misaligned with that understanding. For example, a student who is constantly hypervigilant might be seen as someone that's just, just not paying attention. I mean, smart enough, gets it, just not paying attention. Some kids are completely under the radar, like that girl I spoke with in the high school. Great kid. I met her through the guidance secretary who's, who told me, you work in special ed, Joe, you need to meet regular kids in the high school. <laughs> Kids who are working to be in control, that are pushing back, defiant, aggressive. Why is this happening? I worked with a, I was in a meeting yesterday on a student in an elementary school, and teacher said, how come she doesn't understand that we have her best interest at heart? That all of our behavior is directed to help her out. And she responds to us as if we are trying to hurt or injure her. And she's a kid with a known history of domestic, you know, of, of being a victim of domestic violence in the home, observing her mother being a victim of that violence. And so 
giving them an understanding would help them see it's not about a flaw in that child, it's about her experience and how she has learned to keep herself safe. And then finally, trust. I offered help. You know, I said, hey, come on in at lunch. After you have lunch, come on in before recess. We can redo this science test. You got a 68. I know you know more than that. Come, we'll sit together, the two of us. And the student goes, well, okay. Goes, never comes. Because in that student's mind, it's being alone in a room with an adult hasn't paid me real dividends historically. I'm really not going to go down that road. And so we can interpret that. And these misunderstandings really result from students who come with a skill set that's misaligned with what we assume they have. Brown peg, square hole. The third core idea, based on the multiple impacts it can have, is begins to look at how do we get at this problem? How do we solve it? And the solution really begins by creating trauma-sensitive schools. And a trauma-sensitive school is a school where students feel safe, welcomed, and supported. And addressing the impacts of trauma on learning is at the core of that school. And I show this to a lot of folks, and I also want to make sure that I explain that as we follow the impacts of trauma, and we follow creating trauma-sensitive schools, safe and supportive schools, the thing that starts to come out is that a lot of the action that gets taken, a lot of what we end up doing is putting in place components in the school that are not just good for the kids impacted by trauma, but are good for all kids. And we find ourselves, when we do the action planning, we come around to it, that we're really focusing on very much of universal design elements that are helpful for all students and create learning environments that support the needs of kids impacted by trauma. And that definition, am I missing something? No, you're good. Okay. That definition, um, the other piece of that, it's a fairly general definition. And we provide some detailed attributes that underlie and, if you will, expand that definition. That the individuals in the school share an understanding of the impact of trauma on learning. You know, that meeting I talked about yesterday, um, when the staff came to understand what that child's, if you will, experience lens or that experience from trauma lens looked like, they got it. Oh, I get it now. It was that understanding that allowed them to see this not as some strange behavior or something that was an affront to them, but as a function of that child's experience. So understanding the impacts of trauma is a very important part of creating a trauma-sensitive school. That we support all students to feel safe and settled. And how do we do that? You know, it's consistency. It's structure. It's predictability. These are the things that are the cornerstone of safety. And oftentimes when I speak to educators about this, they make the, the incorrect assumption that if I'm trying to help kids feel safe and really understand them, that I should sort of, I should slack off on some of my expectations. That do I really hold them accountable? And the answer is, you do not slack off. You do hold them accountable. But it's how we do that work with the students. <laughs> if you don't have your homework, I can give you a lecture about homework that's got a very punitive side to it. Or if you don't have your homework, we can get together and I can say, you know, homework's really important. You're a smart kid. I want to help you learn this material. And homework's an important part of that. So let's problem solve about, you know, how can we get the homework done in a way that's going to work for you and it's going to support your learning? two different approaches to the same problem that I think will have very different outcomes. On the one hand, a punitive approach, not sure that that doesn't do anything except begin to push the child away from the school. The compassionate, or if you will, the uh, trauma-sensitive approach begins to engage the student in that problem solving. And when I've had those discussions with students, you know, for me, and, and I'm a psychologist, as soon as the student engages in that discussion, that's a win. Because now they're thinking about it. They're, we're trying to problem solve. They're engaged. Um, 
we address the needs of students in holistic ways. And holistic ways is a, another term we use for whole child. The children, the whole child is not just about academics. It's competency, including academic competency. It's that child's ability to self-regulate, which usually relates to their sense of self-awareness and how they can self-regulate. The child's set of social networks or relationships, both with peers and with adults. And lastly, the child's physical health and well-being. That if we're looking to create trauma-sensitive schools, we're looking to help students learn, we need to be aware of the whole child. And simple examples, think of yourself when you're not feeling that well and you're going to work. I don't know about you, but I could have great plans for a day, but if I'm at 80% and I feel that cold coming, for me it goes from great plans for the day to survival. If I can get through the day and I can get stuff done, wow, that's great. Right? Whereas if I'm feeling strong and, and good, I'm, I'm at 100%, I can push that envelope, I can try that out, I can absorb uh, some of that work and get it done. So again, viewing children in terms of the whole child. Fourthly, connecting students to the school community. Research on the impacts of trauma on individuals is very clear. One of the most significant resiliency factors we can give anyone with significant traumatic experience is connection to a community. It's an incredibly powerful piece. I mean, think of the role community plays in your life. When things go good or things go bad, how do you deal with that? If you're like me, you turn to community, family, my partner, right? my kids, my friends, institutional colleagues, right? We're community folk. And so connection to the community, and for kids, school is, after family, for most children, the most significant community they belong to. So how do we connect all <laughs> students to community? You know, I worked in a middle school and they were very concerned that their kids were, particularly this one seventh grade teen. And what they did is they took yellow um, post-its and they put the name of each student on a yellow post-it and they covered a wall with them. At a, at, a, at a team meeting. And then the instruction from the, the leader of the team was, go up and take the name of students who you know really well. I mean, we all know these kids, right? We're acquainted with them, but who do I know well? You know, I, I know about their life. I can have a discussion with them about things that are important to them. Go take those names off the board. And they did. And there were six names left. And the team looked at each other and said, what are we gonna do about these six kids? They're not connected. And so they started thinking in terms of who are they and how do we connect them, right? Connecting all students. Lastly, school embraces teamwork. That we work together. That this is not just one more thing we give to teachers to do. It's our school community that's working together to create a safe and supportive learning environment, a trauma-sensitive learning environment. And that oftentimes, um, and, and again, I, I, I want to be clear, the role of the teacher in students' education is central. It's critical. I mean, the importance of that student-teacher relationship, research emphasizes that over and over again. So I, I say this not to minimize the role Services of the teacher, in but to be clear that, that the role of support staff Incorrect is to support access teacher. code. Please re-enter your access code followed by the Sorry. pound. No, that's okay. Take your time. <laughs> We've got uh, somebody from Washington and somebody from Buncombe County who Access are on the Google Hangout. Accepted. There are two participants in this conference. Please Perfect. announce yourselves. Hey, Ron and David. What? No, I'm good. Uh, yeah, we're here. Yes. All right. So let me embrace teamwork up among members of the school. And the point I'm making in terms of school-based is that we actually, that support staff support the teacher in the work the teacher is doing in the classroom. I think the other piece around teamwork is how do we as a school integrate with community-based resources? How do we engage our families, our parents? And you know, I don't know about North Carolina, but in Massachusetts and many communities, parent engagement is an issue. It's difficult to do. You know, parents want to feel welcome in school. And so, as you walk into your school or you walk into a school, get that sense, do I feel welcome? Do I walk in and someone says, good morning, it's good to see you. How can I help you today? Right? Or, as what happened to me 
several months ago in a school that we were going to be working in, I walked in and a staff person walked up to me and said, uh, why are you here? <laughs> Literally, why are you here? And that sent a very clear signal to me that I now became very formal. I made sure the tie was straight. Mm -hmm. I said, hello, my name is Joel Restusha. I'm a psychologist. I'm here to meet with the, you know, I became very formal because it was clear this, this, I was not getting that warm, cozy vibe. I was getting the law and order vibe. And in fact, <laughs> no, I was. And as it turned out with that school, their issue was, you know, number of kids who were high flying, you know, high uh, frequent flyer kids who were presenting some significant problems in classrooms behaviorally. And if you looked at how they were dealing with these kids, it was all law and order. And as soon as they were able to shift that mindset to more restorative, yeah, you're still accountable, yeah, the boundaries are still there, but it's going to be restorative practice. We're going to help you learn skill so that when you feel that way, you don't have to rip up the bulletin board. You have other things you can do to help you modulate that feeling and get rid of it. And as soon as they made that shift, even before all those pieces were in place, <laughs> The frequency and intensity of those outbursts came way down. And I particularly enjoyed it because when I walked into the school, I said, oh, hi, Joe, how you doing today? <laughs> and the last is um, anticipation and adaption. I almost call this um, the ability to innovate. I mean, if there's one constant with public schools, certainly in my experience uh, in New England and Massachusetts, is the only thing that doesn't change is change. Things are constantly being changed. We're constantly having demands made on us. And so being able to adapt, I think, you know, in, anticipate some of what those changes look like and adapt. And how do we use sort of innovative approaches to get things done? You know, I was tasked once with creating an alternative school at the high school level for students who were uh, school refusal kids. They weren't coming high anxiety, and as we talked to kids, they, they, there was kind of a pattern that came out where they would say, you know, I get up around 9.30 in the morning, so I'm, I'm late, but I say, you know, I'm going to have a little breakfast, and then I'll go to school, but then, you know, it's like 10.15, and <laughs> beginning of fourth block, if I go to school, I'm going to get a detention, I'm going to have to explain, there's no note, if I don't go to school, it's an absence, it'll take them a while to realize it's an unexcused absence, Maybe I'll write myself a note. I am not going to go today. I'll go tomorrow. And tomorrow they get up, 9 o'clock, 9 30, same cycle. So he said, okay, understand that. So we're putting the school together, and, and we're sitting down, and we're going through, so what are the assumptions one has when you put a high school together? Right? What are those assumptions? And one of those assumptions is, when does high school start? <laughs> high school starts at 745. <laughs> so, okay, we'll start at 745. We'll go to 220. We were very careful to make sure we had time and learning met. And we had literally, and I'm part of this group, I'm a little embarrassed to say, and we're walking down this road and Brian, the teacher, goes, wait a minute. Didn't we talk to those kids and they said that they can't make it? Like, it's just because it's a smaller school, do you think they're going to come? <laughs> Probably not. So why don't we start at 10 and they'll be with us till 4.15? Sure, sounds great. 88 to 90% attendance from day one just by shifting the time. And we were there to be innovative and new, and we almost <laughs> fell into the trap of the assumptions. Where are those bounding assumptions? How do they control what we can and can't do in school? And in a trauma sense in school, we're constantly pushing on that. And I'm sure there are times, in fact, I can assure you in my work with schools, there are times where we have made mistakes, and yet it doesn't work. But that's OK. We try it out, it doesn't work. Status quo, we head back. Let's try something else out. So these are the attributes. Again, you know, we're talking about trauma-sensitive school as one in which students feel safe, welcomed, supported, and where we're addressing the impact of trauma on student learning. It's right up front. It's part of our educational mission. And these are the key attributes that underlie that work. How do we get there? So if the solution is trauma-sensitive schools, how do we get there? And to us, getting to trauma-sensitive school, it's a process. And, and if you remember anything about creating trauma-sensitive schools tonight, please bring this with you, that this is not about a program. Check the boxes we're in. Mm -hmm. It's about a process. It's about how we solve our 
problems. And that's where we start. It's an inquiry-based process that starts with, what are my urgencies? Me, like the school. And if it's a classroom, me, the teacher. What am I motivated to act on? Where are my urgencies? And once I can articulate and understand those, then it's what actions can I take to successfully achieve, or if you will, address that urgency. And that in itself really comes from organizational change literature. What we put on that are those attributes that I just went through, those attributes, those six attributes, what is a trauma-sensitive school, guide our actions. Is the action we're thinking of taking into account the whole child? Is it going to support connecting this child to the school? Is it going to help children feel safe and valued? Is it allowing us to work together as a community? Have we really thought about all the innovative ways we might achieve this objective? Does this action step align with being um, collaborative? And so you have that, if you will, the attributes, if you will, encompass the lens of what is trauma sensitive. The flexible frame, and, oh, I'm sorry, getting ahead of myself. So this, the process we talk about is an inquiry-based process that incorporates the attributes and involves four steps. The four steps are first, what is my urgency? The second is, am I ready? How do we know we're ready to go? That could be resource constraints, but it usually isn't. It's usually training. It's usually understanding. When we test readiness with schools, we'll do a training and we ask teachers, we ask the staff three questions. What did you learn from the training? And we use that question to really analyze, did they pick it up? Like, what, what did they get from what we said? And the vast majority of times you get people saying, I never realized it was that prevalent. I never, you know, you, you get two or three learning components. Then we ask them, what is your urgency? And we usually ask that this way, which is, where do you think it would be important to weave trauma-sensitive approaches into the school? And so we get at the urgency. And the third question is, what are the roadblocks? What gets in the way? And we pull those questions together to answer the question, are we ready? And we look, at, we look for convergence. If you get convergence, what it's telling you is that your staff is sharing urgency. You have a shared urgency among the staff, and they will be mutually motivated to act. If you get a lot of disparate answers that don't converge, you probably have an issue around cohesion and collaboration among the staff. That rather than, that, that maybe your first step isn't addressing those urgencies, it's how do I bring my staff together collaboratively. But if you get that convergence, then you're ready for an action plan. And the action plan takes those urgencies that staff articulated and prioritizes them. My experience when, when these priorities converge, it's two or three that you see. And that's now been through 20 to 25 different schools. You see this convergence, two to three priorities. And so now you take those priorities and say, which one do we want to go after first? And this is where we caution schools. The first school we did, we wrote a four-page four action plan, four pages of steps we were going to complete. And me and the principal said, yeah, we'll be done by November. <laughs> right? Well, we finished two or three of those in the first year. And so it was a very good lesson in small steps where you can achieve success are very important to get things moving, to get people feeling empowered, to get people moving ahead. And so you, you, you develop an action plan, you implement the action plan, and as you implement it, you then take the attributes combined with the framework that I'm going to show you in a bit and say, so how's it working? Did this, we we're achieving our urgency, did we do it in a way that is supporting whole child? Did we do it in a way that is creating safe and supportive environments for children they feel valued? Do we do it in a way that encourages teamwork and collaboration? 
So you kind of filter the results. And then look at, okay, so we've been successful. What are our urgencies now? And maybe we redo the three questions. Maybe we do a brief training. Redo those questions. Come back, reset priorities, and begin cycling through again. One, two, three, four, cycle back through. And the attributes keep us focused on uh, what is a, a trauma-sensitive school. And the flexible framework keeps us focused on whole school. And whole school is really important for a number of reasons. Whole school can be a part of diagnostically, where are we, what do we do well, what don't we do well. Whole school is important for implementation. If I want to do morning meetings, it's more than just leadership saying, yeah, let's do it, and here's a time place to do it. We need to make sure we've got professional development in place. We need to make sure it's going to integrate with academic, you know, the academic classrooms and it's going to fit into the, the daily rhythm of those classrooms. We're going to make sure our policies, procedures, and protocols support that morning meeting. We've got to make sure that the work we're doing there, we're sharing with families and using it to engage them, to help them understand what we're doing and use it at home if that's going to be helpful for them. And the framework that we define this keeping us focused on whole school are these six elements. It's about leadership. You know, if you want whole school change and leadership's not on board, I don't think that's happening. Leadership on board, infrastructure, culture, professional development to support the work that we're doing. You know, in professional development, to get back at that sort of adaptive, innovative, so many times with educators, when you say professional development, they're talking about days and half days. And I worked with a school that, like, we don't have days and half days. We have bites. And they created what they called PD bites. They wanted to do social thinking. They wanted to train the staff in Michelle Garcia and Werner's social thinking curriculum. And so they provided a one-hour training from a staff member at a staff meeting. They put a bulletin board in the CAF for all staff and kids to see, where each week they would put up a new concept, a new idea from social thinking. And then at each staff meeting, they had a 10, 10 or 15 minute PD bite, introducing a new concept, sharing a success. Here's how it worked with. And it wove it into the culture of that school. Those little bites wove it in. And you know, we all felt pretty good. We felt like we were so innovative. But then one of the teachers said, you know, it's funny. It's like I'm trying to teach a math concept. I'll give a little training in the concept, and then we'll practice it Monday, and we'll practice it Tuesday. And, and not for like hours, we'll practice 10, 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, 10, and then it becomes just natural for the kids. Same thing with the PD. Access to resources and services in the community. What are they? How do I get to them? Who's the point person? Are there resources in the district we can take advantage of? Academic and non-academic strategies in the classroom, and how do they integrate and work together? You know, the academics are best built on a classroom that first addresses safety, connection of students, teacher-student relationship and connection. Involves teaching social skills so we all know how to address things when they come up in a way that's going to maintain um, our community and, and support the continued development of that community. Um, and then lastly, the work, the academic work. And if we're looking at the academic work or the islands of competence and the students we can leverage, and are we utilizing universal design approaches to make that work differentiated and available to all my kids? Policies, procedures, and protocols, and lastly, collaboration with families. This is the framework we use. And again, it keeps us focused on whole school. The attributes keep us focused on trauma sensitive, and the process the inquiry-based process keeps us engaged in constantly looking at what are we doing, how are we succeeding, where do we need to modify. And so that's how those three pieces come together. So with that, you have a little more time. Mike, over to you. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. So the, the fifth and final piece, um, in many ways, the hardest piece is how do we get education reform efforts to reflect this kind of practice that we want to see happening in schools. And so the, that's where those of us on the project who are lawyers spend a lot of our time thinking about how do we translate 
these ideas that Joe just talked about into you know, the policy landscape in Massachusetts. And, and this is a hard problem for two reasons. Number one, I mean, we realized really early on that you can't legislate people to care or feel urgent about trauma, right? <laughs> you either see it or you don't. And the last thing we want to do is have some kind of a state mandate that not everybody's going to be trauma sensitive and have schools that really have not come to urgency yet on this issue trying to be compliant with some set of mandates that the state has, has handed down. The second reason that it's really difficult to think in terms of policy about this is because everything that Joe just described to you is about this really delicate process of culture formation and culture transformation in individual schools. It's going to vary school by school. Every school building is its own unique community and culture. And, and that has to be respected. Again, that's very hard to legislate. Um, those four steps of the inquiry-based process that we talk about in this book, I mean, it would be great if we could just pass a law and say, everybody do what's in this book. And as lawyers, a lot of times, we would like to think that we can have that kind of control. But um, any, any sense of that kind of control is just an illusion. You, you can't have laws and policies that do that. So the way that we try to frame our question is what role can law and policy play in setting the conditions that allow for schools that want to do this work to do it? What kind of incentives, supports, resources can the law and policy landscape provide? And also, how can we make some aspects of that landscape get out of the way? I mean, because there are some schools out there that are urgent, that want to do this, and there are constraints that they face because of various laws and policies or mandates. So how can we look at that as well? Now, when, when I talk about our policy work, you're going to hear a shift in the way I talk, because we don't talk about it in terms of trauma-sensitive schools. One of the things that we learned is that people can have a different reaction to the word trauma. One of the very first uh, schools that we worked in, you know, we had this really dynamic principal who was so proud of the work that his staff was doing to create a trauma-sensitive school, and he had played a role in some of our policy work. He had testified at the legislature on some bill that we were working on. And so the local TV station decided to cover him and come in and talk about the work that he was doing. And he was right out there with it. We're creating a trauma-sensitive school. Well, the next day, the phone lines in the superintendent's office were ringing off the hook from parents saying, well, I didn't know my kid was going to a school with all these traumatized kids. What's this all about? There's a trauma school in the district? And so this was a lesson that you have to be really careful about how you talk about the work that you're doing when you are, are public-facing. And so in Massachusetts, um, in terms of the policy work, we've come to embrace something called safe and supportive schools, um, which is the same thing, but just sort of using a different frame. And so you're going to hear me talking a lot about safe and supportive schools. Um, but we know in our hearts that what we're really talking about is trying to help schools become trauma sensitive. So I'm going to share with you some of the details about some laws that we've gotten passed. But I think more important for you because North Carolina is not Massachusetts. There's probably a lot of similarities, but probably also a lot of differences in terms of the policy context. I think it's going to be more helpful to share what the guiding principles are. Um, and then I, I, you'll be able to see for yourselves whether we you know, hit the target with some of these principles. I think sometimes we have, and on some other things, we still have some work to do. But first of all, this idea that school operations should drive policy. The way work gets done, the way business gets done in a school is really where policy should flow from. Um, and we find, at least in our state, that this very often is not the case. What drives policy is a policymaker's idea about what a solution to an education reform problem might be, but they only know schools in the abstract. The concrete way that work happens in a school, we feel, should drive what the policies are. Aligning multiple mandates and initiatives. <coughs> The climate in, in Massachusetts right now is that schools and districts are feeling like year after year the legislature keeps handing down more and more mandates of things that they have to do. They're juggling so many balls in the air. And the last thing we can do is make trauma sensitivity or safe and supportive schools just one more ball that they have to juggle. So what we realized early on is that if we want to get traction, we have to figure out how to frame this in a way that it helps educators juggle all of the things that they already have to do. Locally tailored solutions, and this goes back to what I was saying about each school and each district being its own unique culture and community. Um, this is really about reinvesting in the professionalism and creativity of educators 
Um, and as I heard Joe saying earlier this evening, so often if educators are just given the time to figure this stuff out, they probably know what some of the best solutions are going to be. Um, they just need the time to figure it out. They know their, their community better than anybody else. Let's give them the opportunity to locally tailor solutions. Involving all the stakeholders. Um, you know, everybody's got to have a seat at the table. And that's why, you know, coalitions like this one are so important. The interdisciplinary nature of the work, you can see even in the way our team is constituted. We're lawyers, we're educators, we're psychologists, we're social workers. It takes everybody's perspective to solve these problems. Starting with the choir, and this goes back to what I was saying about you can't legislate the urgency. What we found in Massachusetts is that what's much more effective than a mandate is when a few people start doing something, or a few districts, and it's going really well. And then the next town over is looking and saying, well, how come their score, test scores are going up? What are they doing differently? And it's much easier to spread things through peer um, you know, sharing than it is through a top-down mandate. So starting with those who want to do the work and do it well. And then the last <coughs> one is multiple remedies. Um, there's not just going to be one law that gets passed that is the, the last thing that we need to do or the last word to be said on the matter. We've learned to use the policy apparatus to experiment, to start small, see how something works, then when we go back to pass the next law or the next grant program, tweak what didn't work the first time, all the while involving the schools who've been doing the work as voices in the policy making process so that the policy reflects what schools are learning on the ground. But then it's gonna take multiple iterations um, before you ever get to where you wanna go. So those are our guiding principles. Now let me tell you a little bit about what we've actually done. And this goes back to school operations driving policy. What we started to do about 10 years ago was to take this flexible framework. If we can't legislate the urgency or the vision about trauma sensitivity, maybe we can at least have the policy landscape reflect the way schools operate um, and, and support this whole school approach to solving problems. And then that's going to make it a lot easier when a school wants to become trauma sensitive because the, the, the process about the whole school change is already going to be in place. So we started to take every opportunity we could as advocates when some new law or some new initiative was coming down the pike to say, can we get it to reflect these six elements of the flexible framework? This leadership, professional development, access to resources, um, classroom approaches, policies and procedures, and engagement with families. Anything that you would want to roll out on a school-wide basis within a school building, you'd have to take these six things into account. And so let's have legislators actually think in terms of this. Let's look, actually have them pass laws that reflect the way schools are constituted. And what you see in the circle here um, are all of the statewide laws and policies that we've gotten to incorporate this organizational structure. The ones at the top that are outlined in black are actions of our state legislature. So there was a behavioral health in public schools law. We had a bullying prevention and intervention law that required that um, the State Department of Ed would do a model bullying prevention and intervention plan that districts could use. And we got them to make that model plan organized according to the six elements of the framework. So to ask, well, what should leadership do to prevent bullying in a school building? What kinds of PD do we need to help prevent bullying and so forth? Um, we have a, a new truancy prevention law and the department was ordered by the legislature to create a truancy <coughs> program certification process that was organized according to the framework and also a safe and supportive schools grant program. So if schools want to apply for funding to create a safe and supportive school, they've got to come up with an action plan that takes account of all six elements. This next sort of row of things that don't have the black circle around it are actions of our state department of education that nobody ordered them to do, but that they voluntarily decided to incorporate the framework into some uh, uh, statewide policies. And then here at the bottom are just some examples of local districts that have used the framework in some of their policies. So when Boston Public Schools redid its code of discipline, its code of student conduct, there's a section at the beginning that talks about the best way to um, respond to student behavior problems is to take a whole school approach and to use a, a framework-based planning approach. Um, and then you know, some other uh, uh, local um, examples as well. So you'll see a wrap the circle around the outside. We call the safe and supportive schools framework. And what our vision was, what we hoped, was that the more we got people to understand what the framework was and the more laws and policies were organized this way, that ultimately we could have a statewide framework that says, <laughs> You know, everything that we're going to do about creating safe and supportive schools should be organized according to school operations. 
And so we had a bill that was pending called the Safe and Supportive Schools Bill. And it was going nowhere. It was stuck in ways and means. And it wasn't, you know, we got it out of the Ed Committee because the people who understand education <laughs> knew that this was good policy, but we couldn't get the budget people to pass it. Not that there's a lot of money associated with it, but it just, things go to ways and means to die in Massachusetts, probably a lot of other places. But then what happened was our Speaker of the House um, decided in 2014 that he wanted his big signature piece of legislation to be um, a, a gun violence reduction legislation, a, a gun control bill. And we had the opportunity to go and pitch to him that if you want to reduce gun violence in the state of Massachusetts, you know, one of the things you could do would be to give all kids school environments that are safe and supportive. And, you know, he, he bought the pitch. He said, yeah, I think that that's a, a good thing that I want to do. I want to put that in my gun control legislation. And so this is the, our speaker right here, Bob DeLeo. And in August of 2014, um, here's governor, former governor Deval Patrick signing into law the act to reduce gun violence, which then incorporated our Safe and Supportive Schools Bill. So as of August 2014, we have a Safe and Supportive Schools Law in Massachusetts. And what I'll finish up with is just telling you briefly what this law does. So the first thing that it does is define a Safe and Supportive School. And so it says a Safe and Supportive School shall mean schools that foster a safe, positive, healthy, and inclusive whole school learning environment that. And there's two parts to the definition. The first part, goes back to this whole child I idea that Joe talked about. And what you can see in this part of the definition is those four, what we call, domains for success. The um, developing positive relationships with adults and peers, regulating emotions, behavior, um, achieve academic and non-academic success, and maintain physical and psychological health and well-being. So if you're gonna be a safe and supportive school, you have to support the whole child. And then the second part of the definition is this focus on the whole school environment. A uh, safe and supportive school is one that integrates services and aligns all of these initiatives. Um, initiatives like social emotional learning, bullying prevention, trauma sensitivity, dropout prevention, and so on and so on. Rather than having each of these policy initiatives be siloed from each other, um, a safe and supportive school is one that says, how can we draw all of these things together and realize that social emotional learning is really not all that different from bullying prevention. I mean, teaching social skills is one of the ways that you prevent bullying. Um, reducing bullying is how you, one of the ways that you can make the school environment more trauma sensitive. These things are all connected, even though policymakers often like to hand these initiatives down separately from each other. So that's what a safe and supportive school is under our law. Second thing that the law does is provide a process and a set of tools to help schools create safe and supportive whole school environments. So the safe and supportive schools framework that I mentioned. Um, is, is now established in law. And under each one of those six elements, there's going to be a, a list of things that a school would do, that leadership would do, the kind of professional development you would need, so, and so forth and so on, to create a safe and supportive whole school environment. And then, there's an online self-assessment tool that goes along with this framework that provides an opportunity for teams of educators to come together, and we use this tool in our trauma-sensitive schools work too, and sit in and do some, some self-assessment in the six areas of the framework and think about what are our capacities, where, where can we do better? Um, and then as you complete that online tool, it then generates um, an action plan or, or some priorities that can form the basis of an action plan. In Massachusetts, we have had a statute for a number of years that requires every year that each school in each district does a school and district improvement plan. But these plans are largely focused on academic achievement. They're the kinds of initiatives that we're going to do in our school to get our scores up. There's nothing in the statute that requires the plans to incorporate anything about school culture or social and emotional learning. Um, so rather than amend that law, what we did was create a separate process where any local school committee, local control, can vote to have its schools do this online self-assessment tool and generate an action plan to create a safe and supportive school culture. And if they do that, they can then import that action plan right into their school improvement plan so that it sits alongside their academic goals for the year. And we think this is really important because it shows that these two things are really closely related to each other. Your school culture and climate and your academic achievement go hand in hand. Um, and finally, um, to create this plan has to involve an inclusive process that includes members of the community, members of the staff, et cetera. So it's not a top-down approach. Next thing 
is it provides some elements of a statewide infrastructure to support schools that do this. So the Department of Ed is supposed to do technical assistance um, and maintain this online self-assessment tool and teach educators how to use it. Host state and regional conferences so that um, schools that get grants, which is another piece of the infrastructure, can then share their best practices with colleagues, and that's how we're going to spread this. We're really trying to create communities of practice around this work in Massachusetts. Um, and then finally, the department has to maintain a website that you know gives uh, protocols and procedures and information and then shares it across the state. Um, just to say a few more words about the grant program. Um, the grant program was funded in FY 14, FY 14, FY 15. The calendar 14. years and the fiscal years always get mixed up in my mind. Two years ago, um, it was funded at $200,000, which was enough for 20 schools to get $10,000 grants. And so I want to say a little bit about the thinking about how we structured this grant program. The whole idea of this is that it's about the planning. It's about the engaging in the process of thinking in a whole school way, using the framework, identifying local priorities. So what you might need to do is pay some teachers to stay after school. Um, I don't know if there's unions in North Carolina. There is, because you're the vice president of the union. We're the version of the and union. So, um, in, in, the Massachusetts, <laughs> in Massachusetts, nobody's staying after school unless they get paid. And oh, so, we stay as long as it tells to. And so <laughs> this is one of the things that schools would use the grants for, is to pay teachers to stay after and do planning. To bring in an expert like Joe and give them a training or do some professional development or get, give some consultation. These are the kinds of things that schools would use the money for, but the idea is not that you would get this grant and pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to implement some program. Um, and the things that schools might put in their plan, um, their action plan, might not be things that cost money at all. Um, uh, so it's a, it's a relatively low cost thing. Last year, we did increase the grant program to, or the line item to 500,000. We got it up to half a million with $400,000 going to the grants. So doubling from 20 schools to 40 schools. And then that extra $100,000 was because all of the things on this slide that the department is supposed to do are subject to appropriation. Mm -hmm. And so if they don't get money in their budget to do these things, they don't have to do it. So we got $100,000 for them um, to do these things, and then also, even though this wasn't included in the law, we got the legislature to slip it in the budget line item, they have to do an evaluation of the program. So they will be evaluating these grantees, and we think that that's a really important piece. Final thing that the law does, and this is really important, is it establishes a statewide Safe and Supportive Schools Commission. So this is all of the professional stakeholder organizations in Massachusetts, the school committee and associations, superintendents, teachers unions, school counselors, school nurses, um, an advocate. Uh, my colleague Susan Cole um, was, was appointed and actually serves as the co-chair of the, of the commission. Um, the Secretary of Ed, the Department of Ed, everybody's represented. And these are the seven things that the commission is charged with doing. Um, the most important thing, honestly, is just having a group of all the stakeholders in a room to have these conversations and to figure out how to support schools, to learn from the schools that are implementing the grants, what's working, what's not working, what more can we do to help them and support them. Um, so it's more than anything else, just getting everybody in the room together is the most important thing. But there are seven things that we're supposed to do. Um, so that's our safe and supportive schools law. And interesting, you know, they talk about um, Passing legislation is like a sausage making process, you know, where what you start with at the front end looks totally different when you come out on the other side. So all of this embodied lots of compromises. Um, and sometimes you make out better um, with the sausage at the end. One of the things that we were told by our lead sponsor that we had to do when we drafted our bill was to put a sunset provision for this commission, which we were really reluctant to do because we thought, I mean, this is a conversation that should always be happening. I mean, it should never stop. And so I think we came up with the sunset date of 2023, and I don't remember how we came up with that date. But somehow in the sausage making process, the bill that actually came out, or the law that came out at the other end, they forgot about the sunset provision. They accidentally took it out. So what we ended up with is a law with the commission where there is no sunset. So we're going to keep meeting and talking and trying to solve these problems forever, you know, or until some affirmative act of the legislature ends it. Um, and I think that's, in many ways, one of the, the more important things that came out of this law. So that's what we've done, and um, I guess at this point, oh, here's the website where you can find the publications and um, updates on everything that we're doing. And I think from here, we just really want to know what you're interested in hearing more about and take your questions.